Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today, I'm very excited to talk with Derek Coburn. He's a top influencer and connector. Uh, shout out to Jason Weisenthal, who said, you need to meet Derek. You will love him. Um, Derek is the author of Networking is Not Working, which reached number one on Amazon, the marketing category. He's a co-founder of Cadre, which is an unnetworking community in Washington, D.C. that currently supports over 100 CEOs and business leaders. He will share some of the strategies from his book that helped grow the revenue of his wealth management practice by 300% in just 18 months. Derek, thank you so much for joining me. Jeremy, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. I, I want to hear your big lessons learned, mistakes, successes, what worked, what didn't work, and... I have a, a lot of stuff I have to talk about the journey, but the first thing that strikes me is, so tell me about unnetworking. Why do you call it an unnetworking community? All right, so unnetworking comes from uh, I, one, of my, one of my favorite books on marketing by Scott Stratton, where he talks about a different approach to marketing and the way that he defines unmarketing and specifically the un portion of that word is that we, in order to be successful in marketing nowadays, we, he was suggesting that we have to unlearn everything that we had previously learned about marketing. Mm -hmm. And so he casually mentioned it the one time he referred, you know, mentioned unnetworking and, and I just sort of like took that and ran with it with, with, uh, you know, applying the same, the same definition, if you will, where if, if we're going to be successful when it comes to networking, we really have to throw everything that we that we've learned or that we think is correct about networking out the window. So what do you include in cadre knowing that? So, you know, I think that there are, you know, I think that there are a couple of things that differentiate cadre from other professional groups, but first and foremost, it is that we're not just vetting for successful CEOs and entrepreneurs and professionals, mm -hmm. we are vetting for intangible specifically, mm -hmm. do they have a pay it forward approach when it comes to developing professional relationships? Yeah. And, you know, just because you make a certain amount of money, just because you have a certain type of practice, just because you have a certain number of connections on LinkedIn, that doesn't necessarily mean that you show up looking to collaborate with others in uh you know in a way that mirrors the way that they're doing it right, right. yeah and, so how do you tell so, that for a pay it that? forward how do you know or tell if someone has that pay it forward uh, attitude because i mean i'm sure for someone to join the group you 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 can't spend a ton of time with them all with every single member before no sure so i think we we've we've gotten a lot better at vetting people on the front end. Mm -hmm. And so I'll give you one example. One, a, a mutual friend and cadre member of uh, mine and Jason's, uh, Jason Weisenthal, Marcus Sheridan. Are you familiar with Marcus? Yes, yeah. All right, so Marcus uh, had uh, written a blog post on this idea of assignment selling as he applied it to his pool business several years ago. And when we first launched Cadre, you know, six to 12 months into it, we were fortunate enough to be getting a lot of introductions. You should check out Cadre. And the, the general response at that time was, sounds cool, let's meet for lunch or coffee and you could tell me more about it. And that's sort of what I had always done if I was introduced to somebody that wanted to learn more about my wealth management business. And the problem was we literally just did not have enough time. I mean, I'm running two businesses now right. and we have enough of these introductions coming in. There's not enough time. It's a and good problem so, to have, right? Yeah, for sure. You know, and Marcus says that, you know, companies and businesses that do a, a good job of effectively communicating who's a good fit and who's not a good fit on your website, in marketing materials, in the form of an ebook, what have you, they have rights that other businesses don't have. And they have the right to be maybe what's perceived as somewhat audacious by other companies where you can say, look, take a look at our website, and this is what we do. Uh, if we get introduced to somebody, great to meet you. We check them out, do a little bit of background. They look like they might be a good fit. Take a look at our website, read through the about pages, read through this page. We spend 75% of the time on our website 
describing who it's not a good fit for talking mm -hmm. people out of it i don't i had enough conversations early on 45 minute conversations that ended with uh some something like oh it's 500 dollars a month oh i didn't realize it was that much or oh i'm not allowed to pitch my own services i have to focus more on how i can help other people and and that's just a big waste of time for everybody and so what it does is it, it if somebody goes through that process and then they reach back out to us the conversation is more here's why I'm a good fit. Here's why I should be part of the group. Mm -hmm. And, and for people that don't think it's a good fit, we, we just save our, our time. We save them time by giving them a way to learn about us before we have a conversation. Yeah. So what do you put on the site that you think turns people away or turns people off who aren't a good fit? I think it's five things. So let me tell you, it's, um, I have it right here. It is, uh, ch -ch 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 -ch. I ask that because even for people hiring people, this would be valuable. You know, it would just translate in so many different avenues for any business. So we say literally it's, it's uh, you know, are you right for cadre after we give a brief explanation, uh, explanation before taking the next step, review the list below carefully. It outlines the type of professional we consider for membership. If it does not describe you, cadre will likely not be a good fit. Mm -hmm. So the first is you have a successful business. You're, you know, top one of the best at, at what you do. Uh, we're not about, cadre is not about taking good businesses and helping them become great. It's people that have a good story that, that, that know who their ideal client is that, that are willing to, to learn. Uh, they bring value to the table in the form of being able to make introductions in the form of being able to contribute ideas uh, in the form of being able to uh, leverage, you know, a blog or some type of, uh, of audience. Uh, the third one is your CEO business or the primary network networker at your company. And, you know, the reason that we're not exclusively CEO and, and business owner is that uh, the trusted advisor types, the bankers, the financial advisors, the attorneys, uh, most of those owners or CEOs are not client facing. They're running the business. Right. And they're, if you find the right ones, they're really valuable in terms of what they can yeah. contribute. Right. And so, but if we met somebody that was the marketing director at a company and their CEO was in a client facing role and was the right type of person for it, it would have to be them. Yeah. Uh, we, they make it easy for others to be able to help them. So if they have a weak story, if they think that they are right for everyone, then they're probably not a good fit. And also they're comfortable with the $500 month to month monthly investment. So a big, a big red flag for me is that if anyone ever says, I'm not sure if I can swing that, uh, we know that it's hard to show up focusing on how you can add value for other people and focusing on adding value uh, for others if you're worried about keeping your business afloat. For sure, for sure. And we'll get into why Kadri started, how you started it, but I want to start early on. And uh, a fun fact, it's not necessarily fun, but it's maybe something most people don't know about you, is you uh, have ADD. Yeah, so I have ADD, and that's something that a lot of people will say, and there's nothing unique maybe in having an entrepreneur on your show that says they have uh, ADD, right. but I've, I've been taking medication for it now for four years mm -hmm. and it's, uh, and it's had a tremendous impact on my life. And I don't think the rivalry is the same. Uh, but I, I liken people that have ADD that take medication and don't take medication to boaters who are sailors versus, you know, they have, uh, you know, motorboats, right. And they like completely hate each other and think the, the other's crazy. Uh, but in my case, I was at a point just before my first son was born. This is almost five years ago, I guess, where I was getting by and I was doing really well in my wealth management business because I could make a lot happen in maybe like 15 minutes or 30 minutes a day. And I think that's what made it go unnoticed to me, what made it go unnoticed to a lot of people that I, I would just, I could be so productive in a short period of time that uh, the fact that I had 20 different tabs open in my browser and that I would get distracted and I was, I think I just felt like I was capable of so much more. And one night it was two 30. My wife had been in bed for a couple of hours. I was catching up on some things that I could have easily had wrapped up earlier in the day. Yeah. And I say, you know, when the kid comes, I'm not going to be able to get away with this. Yeah. I went and got checked out. I 
tested, I was like, if you, there's like 50 questions on the test. And if you answer yes or no, or whatever it is like to, for 15 of the 50, then it's likely you have ADD. And I was like 46 of the 50. Wow. Oh my God. <laughs> so what yeah, were you like so, growing up then? Cause th- obviously uh, well, you were I was, diagnosed till later. I was diagnosed when I was 13 and I didn't go on medication. Oh, you were? And yeah. So I, uh, and I'd kind of forgotten about that. And and uh, my, you know, my parents actually now, they sort of see that I went from struggling in school because I wasn't, you know, wasn't the ADD prevented. Focus. Yeah, I mean, it was hard for me to learn in that format. And, uh, and you know, getting out of high school, went to college, but I had read one or two books by the time I graduated college total. And they just That's see how impressive. Much- how did you get by doing that? Uh, you know, just, you learn to adapt, right? I mean, just do, I was really good at math. I mean, I had 720 on my, on my math SATs, but only like 400 on verbal. (laughs) Um, so there was, I mean, I was also running businesses in college. I was doing other things. I, it, I, it wasn't necessarily as important to me and I never bought into it. And, and I like to tell people that I, I didn't conform when it was, when it, wasn't cool to not conform Mm -hmm. nowadays it's more embraced if you you know if if you uh say i'm gonna cut school to go run my comic book business which is what i was doing right and uh you know so i you know i started what's interesting is i i would read but it, it would be hard and i had five or six books open at once and i would read 10 pages at a time and the third day that I that I went on the medication, we had a flight, a three-hour flight. I read an entire book start to finish and didn't get up from my seat, and that's when I knew it was really working. Yeah. And to come just to just to answer your question, you know, my parents, you know, they see sort of how the transformation that's taking place now, and they're like, oh, sh- maybe we should have done it back then. But I yeah. I believe that I learned a lot of other skills sure. that helped me sort of run some businesses now yeah. and have certain uh, uh, qualities or what have you that I wouldn't have had if I was medicated sitting in a chair just learning. But it still is incredibly beneficial for me now when I have to sit down at my desk and work for four or five hours. Yeah. And so kind of have the best of both worlds maybe. Yeah, I mean you channeled that energy in a positive way early on. So tell me about some of your first businesses because you had a few when you were, were younger. Yeah. So like, you know, aside from the, you know, the, uh, the prerequisite lemonade stand and all of that jazz, you know, I had this comic book business in high school where, you know, I was cutting school to be the first person at the comic book store when the new releases would come out. And I would go on the weekends with some older guys, like who were like 20 and like my mom would say I was 16 15 or 16, I'm worried about you going like, mom, these guys are like 20 year old dorks. Like they're into comic (laughs) books. Like you don't have to worry about it. And, you know, get these artists to sign books. I'd bring them back here. But I, I remember like being pulled into the principal's office one day and it was the principal and one of my teachers and my parents and me. And it was, you know, you have to, you have to stop cutting school. You have to get your 2.8 GPA up you have to get a B in this class instead of a C. And I remember thinking in the back of my head, like I'm making $3,000 a month and I'm 16 years old. Like I'm making more money than my principal and my teacher. There's, uh, impressive. you know, uh, there's something that's not right with what you're, why should I yeah. stop doing that just to get a B in biology? Right. Yeah. So where did you get that entrepreneurial you know, spirit from your parents? What did they do? I mean, not really. I mean, my parents, my dad's a CPA, solo practitioner, CP, CPA, and my mom was a great mom, stay-at-home mom. And, uh, you know, so I literally, I just think that, you know, what's interesting is I'm not going to compare myself to some to some of the great leaders, but Cameron Harold in his TED Talk, Let's Raise Our Kids to Be Entrepreneurs, yes, yes. talks about how, you know, the founders of Netscape all have bipolar. Yes. Bipolar is referred to in the medical community. Its nickname is the CEO disease. Yeah. And That's a great Richard talk. Brand- yes. Yeah, Richard Branson has dyslexia. And Seth Godin actually made a point one time saying that these things are not prerequisites to being great 
leaders or running businesses. It's just that when you can't learn the way everyone else learns, you have to adapt. And a lot of the things that you do while you're adapting just happen yeah. to be the things that come in handy if yeah. you want to run a business one day. Yeah. So as a kid, you're making $3,000 a month. What are you doing with the money? I mean, oh, you, you I don't could know. be like the king of king of high school or wherever. What do you do? Yeah, I mean, in high school, I mean, it was I I would save some of it, I would spend some of it. Uh, what's really interesting is when I got into college, I made the dean's list the second semester of my freshman year just to show my mom basically that I could do it. And then by my junior year, I invested in a nightclub in a bar with another guy, mm -hmm. and um, we were doing ten thousand. I was myself was doing like 10,000 a month and that mm -hmm. lasted for six months. I was for a lot of that. It was like paying off some of the student loans and it was spending the money on mm -hmm. my friends and having a good time. But, uh, but you know, I had a 0.6 GPA that semester and I just knew in the back of my mind that any company that hires someone coming out of school, if GPA is important to them, there's plenty of, there, there's, there's no shortage of kids that have 4.0s. And if it's not important to them, then what's the difference between a three eight and a two eight? They're going to look at other things. Right. And then going into that summer between my junior and senior year, I had you know twelve offers on the table for, for like with insurance companies, financial advising companies, and so I had a lot of fun my senior year knowing that because everyone just would go right to the okay, so you're twenty years old and you're making ten thousand dollars a month running a business. Let's talk more about that. Um, so what did you learn in that nightclub business that you still carry on today? Or what mistakes do you avoid from, from those early days? So that was like a really bad partnership that I had. And I guess the thing that I learned at that point was my partner was 25, 26 years old. And he was his motives were to make money and to have it be really profitable. Mm -hmm. And my motives were to hook up my friends and to make sure everyone was having a good time. Mm -hmm. And the reason why it lasted like five or, you know, five or, or uh, five or six months was he wanted to start doing like a, like a hip hop night or something on a Tuesday or Wednesday night and start going to some of the shadier parts of town to promote, uh, you know, what we were doing. And and it started to trickle over. My friends stopped going there. I wasn't having fun anymore, so I got out of it. And then literally a month and a half after I left, someone was shot there. Wow. Holy cow. Yeah. And so it, it was uh, – and I didn't really – for me, it was, a, it was a great experience. I had a good time, but I wasn't doing it to try to make as much money as I could. I wasn't doing it because I wanted to serve a bunch of different markets on a bunch of different nights. It, and, and so it was fun while it lasted, and, and I guess – the lesson is like if I'm your business partner and I leave, then somebody might get shot at your establishment. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> lesson learned. Yeah. Um, so then what brought you to financial planning? So that in between that uh, the junior and senior year, I took an internship at American Express Financial Advisors. And the way that you – By the way, that should, be, that should have been the title of your book. If you, What's that? Like if you break up partnership with me, you'll get shot or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> It was sort of like what, uh, like whatever when Tim Ferriss, Tim, the original title for like the four hour work week was supposed to be like how to make a lot of money and be really successful as a drug dealer. I'm not saying it right, but it was, it was something along those lines. I got it. Uh, so, uh, I, I got an internship at American Express Financial Advisors and the, one of the main things I was doing was cold calling. And as it turns out, I was really good at it. I was really good at, and it's, and it's what allowed me to, to, have a pretty successful beginning to my career that evolved into the practice that I still have to this day. I was just better dealing with rejection than most people. Mm -hmm. And I was so good. In fact, that the head of the American express office had me teach <laughs> the advisors who were doing this for their livelihood. What wow. are like, I was sharing with them tips and things that work, worked and didn't so what was work. And for you? You know, it, it was, uh, gosh, that was a long time ago, but I think the, I think at the end of the day, what, you know, at the end of the day, it's just not caring. It's just not taking anything someone says to you personally, that you're just trying to connect with people. And there were little strategies that would probably be kind of boring for this conversation in terms of how to, you know, 
what might what might make you a little bit better, what might land you a few extra appointments. But the reason why most people failed or succeeded at that mm-hmm. time was whether they could handle the amount of rejection that came with the job. So how did you come to, to handle the re- rejection? You know, I just think that growing up again, sort of going back to this whole theme of, you know, when I was younger, not fitting in for whatever reason, dealing with that at a younger age, trying to fit in, waking up one day and realizing like, hey, it, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't matter what other people yeah. uh, think about me. And you do it enough, you get used to it and it, it stops really, it, it doesn't bother you anymore. And so I don't know that there, I don't know that it's a skill you can teach, but my wife and I talk about this a lot w- with, you know, our four-year-old, yeah. a great kid, but my wife is probably more, more than anything else is afraid of a scenario and there's no basis for her thinking this way, but afraid of a scenario where our kid gets picked on or right. he likes a girl and she doesn't like him back. And and I'm thinking like that's like one of the best skills he could learn. Right. The sooner that he can st- like without wishing anything bad on my right. kid, it breaks your sooner, heart. But yeah, yeah, like the sooner that he can start like dealing with rejection that doesn't really matter. That's not personal attacks on him. That is that just understanding that that's part of life. Then I think the better off he'll be. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So then tell me about then because you go from you transition from doing the cold calls. And what was the next step in your, your financial career? Because then you, you're not doing cold calls anymore. Yeah, so fast forward, you know, I started in 1998 uh, working for Mass Mutual, became a partner at the firm I'm at today in 2001 and built my the initial core of my business off of cold calling. And then I think like most people, I graduated to go into these larger networking events. And unlike with unlike with cold calling, I, I think the two are very similar in terms of how much they are a waste of your time. Mm-hmm. But unlike with cold calling, you're not getting the negative feedback. You're not getting this when you're cold calling and that's what you, and you're trying to get to the next level. A big part of your motivation to do so is that you are not going to have people hanging up the phone on you. You're not going to have people blowing off meetings with you. It, it's not a lot of fun. It's just you have to grind it out. Whereas with networking events, you could go, like I'm in Washington, D.C., I was in Baltimore at the time, you could go to networking events every night and end up having perfectly good conversations with nice people that don't lead to anything and not ever really, really realize, or because you're not feeling the pain and you're not realizing how much time you're wasting mm-hmm. by attending these events. Mm-hmm. So that was sort of the next progression. And for, you know, cold calling is different these days because of the do not call list and because of the advent of social media and other ways to meet people. So that's probably not how a lot of people were starting off their business in 2014 Mm -hmm. or even in 2010. Uh, But I will say in 2008, the market at, at this point, I had sort of made that progression and the market took a big hit. And for me, I had a good base of clients at that time, but I had to spend even more time with them. I had to pay more attention to their money in a good way, in a healthy way, not in a uh, they're going to fire me way, but just, you know, there's there's a lot more that has to be done. That left me a lot less time to go networking, and which begged the question, okay, how am I going to grow my business? How am I going to find more clients if I'm spending – more of my time with my existing clients right now. And that that's sort of what led to a lot of what I talk about in the book. And, and that's trading the time that I was spending at these larger events and finding ways to be more productive to accomplish what I wanted to accomplish. Yeah. So what sparked the creation of Cadre then? Okay. So, all right. So what sparked the, the creation of Cadre kind of totally something totally different and that is I felt really limited and boxed in, and I still am to this day. I mean, the, from, a comp, from a compliance standpoint and, and a regulatory standpoint, they have the shackles on you from a marketing standpoint. Yeah. And as I started to get really great clients who got me, they were a perfect fit, you realize you can't cast a wide enough net to yield more of these ideal clients. And, and so... You know, Gary Vaynerchuk in the Thank You Economy had a line 
that was pretty impactful for me. And he said, you know, these are all these new creative, great things that you can do to create word of mouth and meet, meet clients. But if you're in the uh, 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 legal or finance profession, you are basically screwed. You can't. <laughs> right. Like, I mean, I mean, seriously, I had an opportunity right. to, to write a, a guest blog for the Washington Business Journal. Nope, can't do that. You are not allowed to have testimonials. I have, to this day, probably 15 or 20 testimonials in my LinkedIn uh, profile that have never been approved because you're not allowed to have testimonials. So I really liked and still do like a couple of things. One key thing is just having the big picture conversations with my clients about their lives and how their money fits into it. And I really enjoy that and don't want to give it up. So I wanted to create something else that would allow me to scratch the marketing itch, the entrepreneurial uh, itch, and uh, as opposed to just abandoning it all together. So mm-hmm. it, it, it's been it's been really good so far for a lot of different reasons. So how did you start it then? What was the first, kind of what did it look like in the beginning? Well, what it looked like in the big be- in the beginning was I had really started to focus on building out my network and like one of the things I a big part of the book is walking people through a process for how they can build their own 20 to 25 person on networking group. Uh-huh. And I learned a lot about connecting people and what works and what doesn't work and how to host events and how to frame email introductions and all that. And I felt like, you know, this is something that if we, if we can really do a a good job of curating the people for, especially around the intangibles that I mentioned earlier, it's something that we could probably roll out for more people. And so we approached some key people in our network, some other people that we knew, we shared the idea with them and, and, you know, we just rolled with it. We weren't sure if it was going to work, but we also knew because our format is month to month and it's not a contract it's not an upfront fee that if it wasn't working for somebody after three months they could leave or or we could ask them to leave which we've Mm -hmm. done before Mm -hmm. and so you know with the financial um business you were doing these introductions anyways because that's natural to you how do you decide when to charge and how much to charge for what for the cadre oh um yeah so the everything that i was doing pre cadre was all just to add value for my existing clients. Right. And, and, uh, and then secondarily to position myself and have it be a way that I can maybe meet people that would be good clients or good resources for me. And, you know, it's, it's funny, like I was reading a lot of books at the time that were talking about how important the network was and how to nurture your network, but nobody really had a business around doing that. And so, you know, that was if I was going to start spending a lot of my time and I run this and I run cadre with my wife, we uh, we started it together and, and our partners uh, to this day that obviously want to be want to be paid for it. And so the, the 500, it seemed like it was a price point in between some of the other groups that were not similar in terms of the way we were doing things. But it was it was kind of a guess and ended up being a good guess. <laughs> What did you learn from some of the early members, what you should and shouldn't do with Cadre? Uh, so we just rolled out Cadre in Baltimore uh, a couple months ago to test the scalability of it. Mm-hmm. And what, we, what we've done a much better job with in Baltimore, with, with DC, it was the first time that we were doing it. Right. We, wanted to, we really wanted to nurture it, make sure that it was working. One of the, one of the I know you're going to, you're going to ask me or you know, you might ask me about a big failure. I think that mm-hmm. that one that within cadre was probably spending so much one on one time in person or over the phone with people who were never a good fit in the first place. That if we had the the intel that we have now in terms of seeing, OK, this is what makes it work for someone and this is the type of person that it might not be a good fit for not mm-hmm. that they're bad and we're good or just not a not a pure fit mm-hmm. that we were we were spending a lot of time coaching people and trying to get people and and in, and in every scenario it, it every, like every single one of them to a person it never worked out like mm-hmm. they didn't they didn't they did not remain members past a certain period of time mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so then what do you bring to baltimore because of that so I think what we bring to Baltimore is that we we uh, we can 
we have the validation and we have the proof. We weren't sure if it was going to work in D.C. I mean, the idea of coming, bringing people together where you have to focus on helping other people and you can't pitch your own services, but we want to embrace the idea of you working together. Yeah. We weren't sure if it was going to work. Yeah. And the fact that we now know that it works we, you know, we have a better application process. You know, one of the things that we do on our application process now is we list the five or six primary reasons why, why someone may join, would, would, would be looking to join Cadre. Mm -hmm. And it could be looking to expand their network, looking for big picture ideas from thought leaders. Uh, they want to entertain some of their clients and network at the larger events. And we add in, uh, we, one of them is looking to get more clients for your business, right? And we ask them to split up 100%. They can pick one, they can pick all six, but, but spread out 100% to communicate to us what your motivation is and mm -hmm. what your expectations are. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's almost not even worth having a phone conversation with somebody if they put like 50% or more for they're looking to get clients for their business. Mm -hmm. So that's just one example of yeah. maybe something that as we've gotten better at identi identifying the right people in the front end, it saved us a lot of time on the back end. Yeah. I mean, people slip through the cracks too. How do you let someone down easy when you realize this person is not a good fit? Because I think we all have clients that we probably should fire and will be happier and more productive. How do you do that? Yeah, so I, I'm going to answer that question, but yeah, I'll say ahead. that I was experiencing this in my wealth management business, and I did something similar to what I just described. And I would meet someone, and I would always take the initial meeting or the initial call without knowing much about them. And if we hit it off and had a good conversation and developed some rapport, then I find out they have credit card debt or – they are not motivated to save or they have unrealistic expectations in terms of what they're going to earn in their portfolio. Right. At that point, it's really hard to make an exchange. And so I created something where I was able, before that initial call, I was able to learn. They would take five minutes. I could learn more about them, determine whether they'd A, be a good fit for me, B, be a good fit for someone else in my firm, or C, if we should just tell them. And it's a lot easier to do that at the front end before the relationship is sort of set sail. So that's one thing that I would encourage people to do. It's always easier to, if you get a little bit tougher on the front end and mm -hmm. have the confidence to say, yeah, this is who's a good fit for me and who's not a good fit for me. It will save you a lot of time down the road. Yeah. Uh, but I will say there are people that slip through the cracks sometimes and, and we're not quick to drop the hammer, but we will give people warnings if they're trying to you know if they're trying to be too pushy or they're not following protocol and at the end of the day we i you could argue that at the end of the day a lot of our members are the the, the main value in what they're getting for their 500 bucks a month is to be around a lot of people who are approaching networking approaching uh, professional relationships the same way they are. So if you have mm -hmm. just a couple of people in there that aren't a good fit, they're going to ruin it for everyone else. So I try to remove myself. I try to be somewhat sympathetic, but I also feel like if I'm sympathetic to this person, I'm letting down everyone else who I really yeah. should be. I should have their back a lot more than I, I should have this yeah. person's back. Yeah. So how do you have that conversation? Because I feel like I'm too nice a lot of times and I would, I need to hear your, uh, your words of wisdom on this. It varies. I mean, we've kicked out over 25 people in, in uh, right. over 25 people the first two years. Because it's not like it these could... people are slouches. They're probably highly successful, nice people, and they may approach networking in a different way than what the group is. How do you get rid of them, I guess? Yeah, so. and you know, it's just, it's just one of these things where I will say at a very holistic level that the ancillary benefit of having two businesses at the same time is it gives you way more confidence to stick to your guns in terms of who's a good client or not. Yeah. So I, in, in either the wealth management business or with Cadre, I can be more selective and really, if I say this is a good fit for, for me in terms of a Cadre, this is who is a good fit for, for being a Cadre member. If I was just running that business, I may be more likely to say, oh, we'll let them slide. Or I did it all the time in the wealth management business. 
oh, you don't quite meet our minimums or, oh, you have another advisor that you want to have manage half your money while we manage the other half. And those relationships, whenever a business owner budges on – and, and makes exceptions, works with friends, works with people they know aren't a good fit. I think that's where 95% of problems happen for businesses. Mm -hmm. So I will say that that allows me to have more confidence than otherwise. But we don't have, look, I have a ton of email templates. I have a ton of pro processes. I have 300, a 300 page systems manual for the wealth management business. I have a ton of Jing videos, documents. We use Sweet Process for Cadre for storing all of our systems. And I have to say, there's not a system for how you remove somebody from Cadre. Right, because it's tough. In every, yeah, and it's just because in a lot of situations, it's it's different for different reasons. There are, there are some people that they stop showing up or they stop responding to other people. But, you know, there was uh, somebody recently where we had – I had seven or eight different members complain about this person over the, over the span of two to three months. And, and it's like, we get feedback from our members and, yeah. and, uh, we're not, we we're, if one person says, if person A says person B kind of did something that I don't like, and it doesn't happen very often, that's fine. But if two other people have a problem with person B, there's probably something wrong with person B <laughs> in terms of the way that they're doing things and the way that they're rolling. And so, yeah. you know, it, it's one of those things where I try to be, I, I, I try to be sympathetic and I try to, to do, you know, do right by that person. But over, but really we have to be aggressive at defending the brand and what yeah. we're all about, because the second people think, Oh, I'm being pitched to, or I, if I open my mouth and say, I'm, I'm having an issue with this right now. And it leads to me getting three follow-up emails from a person that was sitting at that lunch, then how is Cadre different than any other type of networking they could be doing? Right. So, Derek, what's the t the greatest part and the toughest part about having your wife as a business partner? Well, I would say the greatest part is that we get to, you know, we get to spend more time together. And I think, I don't know if she would answer this question the same I don't same want way. you sleeping on the couch at any point, so just... No, no, it's fine. No, no, no. Uh, I would say that the other great thing for me is that I have, I have a lot. Of, I know a lot of people, especially my my really successful clients in the wealth management business, where they travel all the time, and they are always, you know, staying at the office, spending the night at the office, whatever the case may be. And I, I think that part of the prop, part of what they struggle with, some of them is that their their family their wife their kids are sort of like gosh like what are you what are you doing exactly and so i think that one thing is that we always know what's going on in the business and we always know what has to be done and so if i need to stay at the office until nine or ten o'clock at night mm -hmm. there there she knows why i'm staying yeah. there right There's that mutual understanding there yeah 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 and I would just say, like, the toughest part is, you know, and it's something that we still work on all the time. It's it's really setting boundaries and yeah. and, uh, you know, when when are we having a conversation as business partners and right. when are we having a conversation as husband and wife? Right. And so we we it, it, you know, we we try to really focus on it. We'll schedule date nights where, OK, we're not going to talk about business. That's hard and, to do, though. It is hard to do. It definitely is hard to do. And, and so, you know, it's, it's not, it's not always, you know, the easiest thing in the world, but I think we have co a complementary skill set and we do some things like, so for example, Melanie is never going to have the conversation or send the email to have somebody uh, tell somebody that they're no longer welcome in cadre, <laughs> right. you know, but at the same time, you know, she is great at so many things that I'm not great at, you know, just, yeah, and so it's kind of like a, a good cop, bad cop. So kind what of are thing her that strengths have. that complement you? So I think that Melanie's strengths is that she is a lot more, she is much more understanding and, uh, and, uh, uh, and, and really willing to, to, She's very, she's very, I would say, I'm trying to think, because I could just run off a bunch of things. She's, she's very, uh, she's like a, she was a cheerleader 
um, for a year or two and then became the marketing director and marketing director uh, for the Redskins or marketing director for the Redskins cheerleaders, which she was for a while. And she really is. She says this in her bio. She is a cheerleader for our members. Mm -hmm. And so she will go out and and in a very authentic and productive way, promote their interests, promote what they're doing, uh, bend over backwards to help them and, with whatever it is that is going on in a way that I am much more sort of regimented. Like I want to help them and what they're doing, but if, but, but I might not, I probably won't do as an effective job. I'm not going to put maybe exclamation points in the tweet or, <laughs> um, you know, remember, remember to thank everybody that has to be thanked. So like she, mm -hmm. you know, if you, if you were to send me a gift, you would be waiting probably five years from now and you would still not have received a thank you note. And if you sent my wife a gift, you know, you would get the best thank you note you've ever received. So she's, I think she's, uh, you know, I, I can learn, I can certainly learn a lot from her when mm -hmm. it comes to, you know, this, uh, this being mindful and being considerate of like everyone and what they're doing. Yeah. It's very organized, very thoughtful. Um, so what made you decide to write the book networking is not working? You know, I just really felt that I, I, I don't think that anybody is that reads my book is going to say, Oh my gosh, like you you are so innovative and, and these ideas that you have developed are 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 just uh, you know, like nothing I've ever heard before. I think what most people will say and have been saying is, "Oh, like this is a book that I should have written," or "Why haven't I thought of doing this before?" Mm -hmm. And so I think the book maybe has been in me for a while. I mean, I only mention cadre one or two times, and it's not a book about cadre. It's a book about how to do all the things that I mm -hmm. did in the wealth management business before cadre existed. Mm -hmm. And it was just coming to a realization over time that I sort of felt like what I was doing was stuff was, were, were things that everyone was doing. And I kept hearing, Oh wow, that's a really good idea. I'm going to try it. Or, Oh, I, I, you told me the story about your wine tasting events and I started doing them and had a big impact. And, and so I literally, I, I felt like it was something that I could do to just, uh, you know, give back and share, what I learned that made my business and my life, I think, much better in the yeah. long run. I ask that because it's not easy to write a book, and I'm sure it's not easy someone with ADD to write a book. It's easy Was when it you're a on hard medication. process? Well, it is. <laughs> Was it a tough process for you? It is really tough. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, uh, I mean, it is, uh, it's just, you know, I, I would say that it, it probably took me, nine months to write the first two chapters and it took me maybe two weeks to write the final six really but then i had people edit it and then i rewrote it and i ended up working i ended up meeting a guy named niels parker is a structural editor and he was just amazing and yeah. and uh, you know and and where his talent lies it's in taking your content and your stories and doing putting it all together in a more polished way a more easy to read way and 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 so working with him and the money i spent on him was you know was one of the best decisions that i've ever made but you know it was really frustrating and i'll tell you i learned something at the end and there was later an article i read when i was done that sort of summarizes what i was going through and that is um you you the art the title of the article was called you can be busy or successful but you can't be both and it has to do with uh, has to deal with this idea that you have a schedule and if your schedule is always booked with client meetings or tasks to do and you're trying to work in time for big picture creative thinking and you're limiting yourself or not scheduling it at all in the first place it's going to be really hard for you to, to make those leaps to take your business to the next level and what I did for those first nine months was I was scheduling an hour here, an hour there, and it wasn't coming to me. Yeah. And the reason why it was about two weeks into me scheduling an entire day at a time yeah. to where I finally hit my, you know, you know, I got into this state of flow, this amazing state of flow where even though I said it took me two weeks, 95% of it was in one probably six hours uh, sitting.
Yeah. Where I just got, and I, I had given myself the, the buffer and given myself the flexibility to not have to, to produce on demand, if you will. Yeah. Yeah. So you just carved out a huge chunk of time and that gave you that kind of allowed you to get in that flow. Yep. So what did the structural editor do that was so important for your book in particular? All right. So what I will tell you is the way he described it to me was because I had, I had written my book and I had already I had received feedback. So I wrote it. I had 15 people in my network generously review my book and leave comments in a Word document. I merged them together. I had over 1,200 comments. Wow. And made revisions, rewrote it, worked with a copy editor, and then sort of found him and uh, found him along with Ryan Holiday, who I worked with and helped me with uh, uh, the marketing I did with the book. And the way he described to me was, look, the reason why you've gotten good feedback, because I was ready to hire him. I said, I know it can be better. But I've had people like Chris Brogan and James Altucher and Roa Bargava. I've had New York Times bestselling authors read my book. And I know them all well enough to where I know they, I, I trusted that They'll they tell you the truth. wasn't yeah. good, right? Yeah. And they said it was good. So, and I believed them, and I think that that's, that's how they felt. So he said, look, the reader, the primary audience for your book is not them. It's their blog reader. And it's not that it's a dumber audience. It's just that people who write and produce content and consume content – all the time, it's easier for them to consume content. Whereas most people just read one or two books, uh, one or two books a year. And so if you have two paragraphs that yet that your reader has to go back and reread once or twice, or they have to pause and think and process, maybe that's a breaking point. Maybe they put your book down and then maybe they never pick it up ever again. Mm -hmm. Whereas if it flows really well and it's concise and it's, and it's and it gets to the point more effectively. And I've received a number of number of the reviews that I have on Amazon, a number of the emails I've received uh, are along the lines of, you know, hey, I have a lot of books that are just lingering on my Kindle that I started and never finished. And with yours, I was able to pick it up and it was so easy to read that I just didn't put it down. Mm -hmm. That's a big compliment. Yeah. So yep. what's one thing someone should take out of the book? You know, so my big picture, you know, the first the first couple of chapters are calling the larger networking events into question, randomly attending these things. And and, you know, there's a quote from uh, my buddy David Seitman Garland in his book where he says that networking events are like nightclubs and that everyone's looking for a professional one night stand. Right. And I think there are a lot of reasons why you're going to have a hard time being successful attending the larger events. First and foremost is that. If you were to ask 10, 20, 30 people, how do you define networking? You're going to get 10, 20, 30 different answers. So it's really taking a look at what's working in the dating scene and uh, looking for love market where we're sticking with the nightclub and, and networking event analogy. And if you are, I approach networking because I want to develop, I want to meet other successful people. I want to develop benefit mutually beneficial relationships that are not going to happen overnight. I'm not looking for a new client. I'm not looking for a new job. Yeah. And, you know, so compare that to, to looking for love. Well, th those kinds of books don't begin with continue going to nightclubs and bars all the time. Right. They, they talk about hosting dinner parties and hosting your own events and going on double dates and leveraging your friends, i.e. in, you know, in the professional sense clients. And, Every just about every book I've ever read about networking uh, or article, and even the ones I enjoyed a lot, it, it they it's all about how to do the big event the big event thing a little bit better. Mm -hmm. And I sort of said, look, let's just we can. There are there are times where it makes sense to go, but for the most part, let's stop going to those and let's start doing more of these smaller, curated, intimate gatherings mm -hmm. on your watch where you're bringing your clients some of their people, some other professionals that you know together in a in an intentional way that is A, first and foremost, adding value for them and B, setting you up to meet more of the kinds of people you want to meet. Yeah. So Derek, also you have on your book have some quotes from some pretty amazing people and authors. How did you know some of them and how did that come to be so that obviously they felt 
and comfortable writing that quote for you and actually having you put it on the back of the book. Okay, yeah, so so they're from there. I would say that uh, in the case of in the case of Dan Pink, Chris Brogan wrote my foreword, and then Dan Pink, Cameron Harold, and James Altucher, all of them spoke at cadre events, and and from the beginning, Chris talks about this in his foreword. Apparently, I've been I've been told by most of the speakers that we've had that we've brought in that we the information we provide them with the way that we treat them the way that we cater to them as it was the best or is one of the best experiences that they've ever had wow. and so i think what's interesting is that a lot of times especially with the money they're charging or the amount of books that people are getting to acquire them they a lot of these organizations are viewing it as a transaction and i still view that as i want to make it a great experience for them as yeah. well yeah and you know going back to you know we had chris almost two years ago i mean i wasn't i wasn't even really thinking at that point about writing a book yet right? that would be a few right. months later so i'm never motivated by by you know what can i get out of it sure. but I still viewed it. The ancillary benefit was I had access to them and it was an opportunity to develop a relationship yeah. with them. And in, and in most of the cases I was able to find what they were working on, what, what they could use help with if I could make a contribution and just kept in touch with them to where, uh, when I asked them for, you know, and I asked different, different, different folks for different things, they, uh, they were, they were receptive, which was pretty cool. So what did you do to make their experience so good when you brought them in to speak? So, you know, it was, you know, I'll, I'll give you an example with, uh, with Dan Pink, you know, we, we sent him, we sent him an agenda and we described who our clients were and, uh, what they were focused on and told him about the, attire it, we 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 strongly urge all of our attendees to wear jeans really and okay. yeah i mean it's just there there's a lot of there's a lot of science and data and we do this with our cadre our mem just our member events too that 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 supports the idea that you know you throw suits and ties and whatever the female equivalent is <laughs> you know in terms of attire and and boardrooms and all of that makes people more competitive and less collaborative and that people are more likely – people are going to be more engaging yeah. if they're comfortable and less they're relaxed. Less laid back, more relaxed, yeah. So we, we use like theaters where they're doing plays and and so it's like – it's it's classy but it's also low-key. Like yeah. we'll have you know uh, like a beer tub with an awesome local brewery for them that we, that we uh, work with. And, yeah. and so we just, you know, just giving him a lot of these and his response yeah. was sort of like, wow, it would be, a, it, I've never gotten an email like this. And like, it would just be amazing if I received emails like this uh, all the time when I speak and I'm doing it to help them, but I'm also doing it because like in the case of James who came to speak around choose yourself there are some concepts in that book that are leave your job and go start your own thing. You no longer have to wait to get picked. Well, I want to make sure in order to deliver the most value to, to our members and to the guests of our event, like, look, it's going to be 80 to 90% CEOs and business owners. So you, you know, if you're planning on talking about, they've already left their job, they're it's running your own job, company. right? Like, yeah. like that's who you want to target the message more to. Yeah. So it positions them in a way where they can be more successful, but it also makes sure the, the message is as relevant as possible for the people who are there to, to hear them. Yeah. Yeah. And one of the questions I always ask is about mentors and it seems like obviously in a group like this, who's, um, what's a good piece of advice you've gotten that still you kind of think about on a weekly basis? Hmm. Uh, I, I would say that I have, uh, I do not have like one or two people that I go to as a mentor that I have a number of different people that I view as unofficial mentors for me in different areas of my life. So that if I want to, if I want to, uh, eat better, if I want to, 
talk, you know, one of one of my uh, one of our great friends who's a cadre member, Marissa Levin, you know, she ran has been running a business as a partnership with her husband for 19 years. Right. So she's a great person to talk to about what we were talking about earlier. Yeah. And, you know, uh, Marcus, who I mentioned earlier, is a great person to talk to about that, you know, uh, about having a killer blog and making it easy to uh, uh, attract people that are looking for what you have. And there's spiritual mentors. There's so it, I, I would be doing a lot of people a disservice if I were to single anyone out. Yeah. And I would say that, you know, the quote that I gave earlier from Gary V was, was, was really great advice. And I think another one that I mentioned in my book from Seth Godin uh, is the the value we are now entering the connection revolution right and the and what he proposed which I completely agree with is that the value of your connections is now worth more than the value of your service or widget yeah and so there's some really cool stories and things that I talk about in the book that we didn't talk we didn't talk about today but it but around the idea of most of us are competing with indifference right that it's not like there are people running around saying, oh, my God, I love my financial advisor so much and I would never leave. It's just right. that he's fine and I think they're good. But yeah. there are things that you can do to disrupt that. And instead of focusing our time trying to be a little bit better at the thing that we do, that, hey, maybe we can just be really good at finding other ways to contribute to that relationship mm -hmm. that don't take the place of that, uh, but that make you stand out from your competition. Yeah. Derek, I appreciate your time. We're right at the hour. I have one last question, but tell people where they can find you, where they can find your book. Yes. Yeah, so my uh, my website, DerekCoburn.com, and on on uh, Twitter, I'm Cadre DC, which is where I like to meet people and hang out and have conversations. And then if they're interested in learning more about what we're doing with Cadre, it's CadreDC.com. Yeah, and you guys have great speakers. Check it out. Um, and my last question is this. So if you had to choose right now three people or two people that – I don't know if you're going to answer this question, but I'll ask it anyway. Um, who you want to join Cadre? Who's like the ideal person who hasn't joined Cadre yet in D.C.? Do people – actually, do people typically join only if they're local or do they join if they're not local too? Yeah, we have like three or four members now. So one of our members, uh, uh, Joey Coleman – who is a is a great friend and uh, just did a creative live course on first hundred days customer experience. It's really mm -hmm. good. He was in D.C. and he moved to Denver about a year and a half ago, and he continues to be a member and still mm -hmm. flies in two out of every three months for the events. And so we have we have a few, but really I think it's it's yeah. it's mostly going to to it's going to benefit more the the folks who are local yeah are there who are the top people you you think should you would like to join cadre that would bring so much value to the group that haven't joined yet yeah i mean i think i i think that of the people that i know they are they've either joined or we've had that conversation mm -hmm. right and what i will say is that anytime i've had to convince somebody to join if they were on the fence if if they were unsure if they if it was worth the time or if they would get value out of it even when i knew that it would be a good fit it's never worked out mm -hmm. it's never worked out and so and so really it where it does work out is where 90 percent of our members join is they read through the website they're excited about it we have a great conversation they attend an event as a guest and they basically tell us that day they're going to join mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so there really there really isn't anyone in in dc that i that i can think of that uh, oh my god like oh my gosh you should be in it and you're not in it and i think that there's maybe a few people that that maybe they maybe it's not a good time for them you know they don't have the time or uh the bandwidth and i don't want somebody to join if they're going to be inactive and they're not going to right. be participating right right no Derek, i appreciate your time um i've been looking forward to this for a while so thank you everyone should check out uh derek's book and check out the website and I appreciate it, Derek.
Thanks, Jeremy. This was cool. Thanks, man. Thanks.